Let's talk about now pollinators, bees and other pollinators. You know, a, we're talking about having a great garden, a productive garden. And to have a productive garden, we need it to be full of activity by our pollinators. And so tonight we're going to learn about how to attract and keep those pollinators in our home landscape. And to do that for us, we have Todd Wyman, the Cass County Horticulture Agent a beekeeper himself. So let's welcome Todd to the forums. Um, a lot of times we'll get asked on honey beekeeping, um, if you're in full gear, is it possible not to get stung? I say, no, I, I think I've been stung every time and they just, it's just what it is. So I just wanted to get that clear that I've been stung a lot. So if I start shaking, it's because of that. Um, the, the talk I have tonight, um, I have a talk that is from Ru Russ Bryant. He did a lot of work with native um, bees and, and, and trying to find out information on them. But there really isn't a lot out there for our native North Dakota um, pollinators and bees. There just isn't a lot of information. There, there is information on regular honeybees and other, other types of creatures, but there really isn't a lot. And so I'm going to go through his presentation and I, I didn't um, dumb it down or anything like that, but I will. I will skip certain parts, but we'll go through it and um, go from there, I guess. Skip that. Um, with all the honeybee talk and, and such, th there's a number of different good things that basically come from honeybees, but also from the, the other pollinators too, and we're, I'm going to focus more on those tonight. Um, the pollination of our plants for our food supply is, is in trouble, basically. Um, 95 um, agricultural plants benefit from that, $1.5 billion. There's a lot of, of our way of life is affected by pollination of these little bees on flowers and also our food sources. And, and there's, there's some problems with, with that. And we're going to kind of get into that a little bit. Another thing I'd like to point out is that some of these insects are becoming extinct and some are extinct. There's 128 native pollinators that they have names for and such, but there are more out there that, that they don't. And in, in many cases, um, what will happen is these will actually become extinct before they can name them and they, and they just won't be around. They, someone might have an old one in the collection and say, what is that? And they figure it out, but there aren't any more. And it has to do with a lot of different things. Um, why, why would that matter, you know, if we don't have the, the cute little gray one with the little polka dots on it? Um, some of these insects have um, a venom in them that, that, that they're, they're thinking is good for a lot of the diseases we have, um, HIV, AIDS, um, cancer and such. And so if those insects disappear, they're, they're really, it's, it's, it's near impossible to create that venom um, from just chemicals and such. So this is not me. If this was me, I'd be the person fully dressed, completely engulfed in the suit with extra gloves. I, I don't like to be stung, but it happens. Um, so I'd be the guy over on the right. Um, dirty suit, completely safe, standing furthest away from everything. The other two guys, um, I've met guys like that, and, and at first it's good, and after a while they all get stung and they do actual bee dances. So um, when I say when you work with any of these bees, suit up. One major um, thing to think about is that the bees like flowers, and if you have a monocrop, where it's just one solid field of, for example, corn, what have you, um, you don't really have any of the prairie flowers in there. They're, they're, sometimes there's not even weeds. The fields are clean. There's nothing but one thing. And if you were to eat, um, for example, if you were to eat just apples every day, yeah, apples are good, but if you only ate apples, you know, they're, as far as the diet of the bee, it, it's kind of a poor, poor diet. So multiple different flowers. And some people say, well, what, what, what can I plant so that, you know, what is the best flower to plant? And I always say plant multiple species. Um, you don't exactly know that they're, they're going to eat one thing over another. You can kind of guess. But as far as, you know, if you had 50 different flowers in your, in your garden versus two, I would say you'd have a much better, um, healthier bee population. And pesticides, of course. Um, I've had honeybees and mistakes happen. Um, and I've come out there and all my bees were dead and it was because of that. And, and you know, things happen, so, it, but it's not good. So if it's killing your honeybees, it will also be killing your, your native bees too. 
the study by Russ, um, he wanted to find out two different things from this. He wanted to see if there was a comparison or if there's a difference or what would be the importance of having a lot of floral diversity or having a very good nesting environment. A lot of the bees we have in North Dakota are ground bees, and so uh, fertile, fertile um, soil, sandy loam soil, and I've seen them out at Absaraca. I've actually walked into them and got out really slowly, but um, the, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of um, environments that they can have, and so he wanted to see, is it the food source or is it the environment or both or neither? What, 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 what would he find out from, from this study? And I'll, and I'll get to that toward the end. And I think he might be a little bit surprised by it. We did some studies here. Some of you probably um, across the state um, have, have been to these towns or actually live in these areas. And, and you can obviously read what it says, but there are the different studies that were done where he did this. CRP or restored prairie, I think most people know what that is, versus native prairie. And if you can look at, if you can see on the pictures here, you'll see that the native prairie has a, a wider diversity of um, forbs, um, different herbaceous flowers. Um, the CRP, it's not a, you know, mon just one system, but it does not have the diversity as, as the native prairie does. This is a picture of Russ. Obviously, before he started this thing, he's nice and clean. He's not, no. Um, it's just a picture of Russ out there. And these are the blue vein traps that he, he used to capture the insects in the area and, and do counts. And um, you can't really just go out there and count them because obviously they move. But if you capture them in this trap, you can, you'll know. Native bee catches. He did this over a two year period. On the CRP, um, you can see that. For the 2012, I don't think there's a point down here. Anyways, um, for 2012 and 2013, for the first, for 2012 in CRP, he had 7,232,000 bees trapped. And then in 2013, 4,011. And you get it to the um, native prairie, and it's, it's a very almost exact number. It's 5,662 versus 5,659, almost insignificant number um, of that. So there's, um, it's very interesting as to if you look at the CRP, there's a, there's a great difference in the numbers in, in, in the native prairie. It's more of a, a stable environment. I love the picture of this bee. Um, I, I just, you know, I, I'd hate to have one that size, but um, I, I love the picture of it. And, and, and if you look at this closely, you'll see that the different types of bees and how many he had. Um, this bee right here was one that he said, they call it the bigger bee. And it's a, um, well, I can't even hardly say it. Let's stop. Alas told us. I it said it earlier, but um, I'm not going to try it again. But um, this is the most abundant native bee, and if you look on the, the top left, you'll see that that's where the range is. It's, it's close to 8,500 compared to the others. There's a number of different tools that, that were used to, to do this, and um, some of the science behind it is quite fascinating, and some of it's kind of boring um, for me anyways, because uh, I, mean, I don't think I really get the, the full gist of it but I'll, I'll do the best I can to keep it at a, at a level that you'll appreciate. And if not, um, tr thank you for not falling asleep while I'm talking. Um, if you look at the pollination, it, the, they checked three different types of need for the pollination model. You need land, um, different pollinator species, and, and what kind of land. And he kind of went through this a little bit. The various, <laughs> the crops that you see there are actually crops that people grow, not really wildflowers. And he went through the different types of um, of um, what, the, what, the, what the bees did with that. As far as, um, well, let's skip this here. Inputs and outputs. Basically, a, a common sense type of thing is that you would need both nesting habit and floral source maps. And you have a good pollinator habitat, but you know that's, that's not really scientific. And so he went a little bit further with that and checked it out. Here's just a picture of um, old part of South or North Dakota, excuse me. And um, from space, kind of not really much there. But if you look at on this one here, um, here you show the areas of high quality where everything was great. There's a lot of pollinators in the blue and in the, in the red. It's real poor quality. That They have a very difficult time surviving there. They just, there just weren't very many there at all, if any. Here's a little more, um, more of a differentiation again. Floral resources versus potential nesting locations. One thing that he did find with this is that 
the better the floral, the, flo the more diverse floral population that he had, the more native species he had, the more bees. Even if the, the, the ground was perfect for nesting, if you didn't have the, um, the floral, it just, there just wasn't very many bees. And so it, it, you know, if you think, well, both are necessary, in all reality, it'd be better if you had to choose one to have a higher floral place than an actual place for them to drill holes and to live. Which is, which is, I thought kind of, that, that's what I got out of this, and it's probably be very interesting. Here, I, I kept these slides in here mainly for the pictures of the bees. Um, they're, they're quite beautiful and, and fascinating, and in the end, he'll combine it all, and, and um, we'll go through the objectives. But for this here, um, if you want to take a look at them, and if anyone has very good Latin knowledge, Tom, no, no, it's um, Agapostemon, I believe, Melisodes. I mean, if you look at these creatures, they're, they're just fantastic and beautiful. Lassio blossom, bombus or a bumblebee, obviously, and um, they're not as fun to, to actually pet as you might think. Um, here, here, here the, the information was gathered and combined, and basically, if you have, you have poor quality habitat, for example, poor soil and um, poor nesting, you still have a lot of pollinators. Um, and that, that, that was the big thing that I, that I pulled out of this. And it, I thought it would be quite fascinating because I thought, well, if they're not there, you know, if they can't really build a, a good nest, they probably won't be there even with the flowers. But that's not what I got out of the study. And um, I, I thought it would be quite fascinating with that. Um, obviously, if you have um, from this, if you had a lot of different diversity in your plants, um, the bees just did well, regardless of of the habitat, um, you know, the types of soil. Um, if you look on this map of North Dakota, the best place to to find these would be out in the southwest corner, um, kind of on the the eastern side. It's like a a, a sea of red. It, it's just you know, it, it, it's just quite unbelievable what isn't there versus you get more to the western part of the state. And I guess that kind of makes sense um, if you get more into the, the monocrops and such. I'm going to jump ahead here. There's, there's a ton of people who I talk to about this um, so I can understand it. And I'd like to thank them all, but um, that would take about five minutes, and so thank you. If you look at this here, a lot of people want to build things. And, um, and if you're like me, you want to build things, but you really don't have the skill and so I just pay for it. No, um, you can you can make these. This is a little nesting box, and I'm just going to read off of here. It's um, basically a four inch by four inch nesting box, and you want untreated wood. And if you don't remember anything at all, remember to use untreated wood. Um, and you'll want to drill holes in there. And in here, he has three eighths inch hole with, and three inches deep. And and these have done quite well for him for for bees. Also, um, wax free parchment paper in there. And, and and I'll show you some of the pictures of bees that, that moved in here. He had this by some alfalfa fields in North Dakota. And a little closer look, you see there's a little bee in there just kind of doing its thing, probably not wanting its picture taken. And then he pulled one out and um, a little closer look at it. And uh, it has its arms pinned down, so it's, it can't really wave at you. But you can see, like, hey, you know, I don't think he's too happy, but um, something to think about, I guess. You can build these things and have success. I've seen kids do this too with um, straws from different types. You can buy the straws or, you know, sometimes kids will get a bunch from a restaurant. It's like, oh, great, now what do we do with these? And, and they've made different types of homes with those too. Um, you might be wondering why I have this western prairie fringed orchid picture on here. Um, it's a very rare, beautiful plant that's um, found here in North Dakota. This is a collection that I, I brought and I have over there behind Scott. Um, you can look at it, but don't touch it because I, I, it, it's, it's very difficult to make these collections, a lot of time and effort. Um, if you look at all these creatures here, they are all associated with this, this plant. So if something were to happen to this plant or some of these pollinators, you, you break a cycle and, and, the, and the, the others would soon cease to exist. Um, you got your sphinx moss up on the top right. Um, some of your weevils on the left feed on the plant. They all are hooked into this plant in some way or another. And so it's, I find that to be quite interesting and, and um, how delicate things are. 
here are some um, people always are. What's the difference between honeybees and bumblebees? Um, you know, you say, well, bumblebees are bigger, but that doesn't help. Um, you take a look at this. We have some worker bees up there in the top, honeybees, and in the bottom, um, just some regular bumblebees. And I, I have those also here. Um, it looks like my time's about up. Here's a picture of um, butterflies of, of North Dakota. Um, the actual butterflies gardening in North Dakota. This is a publication that that you can only get online now. So if you want it, you need to print it off yourself. And um, b wonderful publication that and beautiful pictures goes through a number of different flowers for attracting pollinators. So it's like, well, I wish you had said something about that. If you pull this site up, you'll have a ton of different flowers that attract beautiful butterflies, and and you can read on that. So. Looks like I got a few minutes. If anyone has any any questions, or some of you probably are still awake, you wanna okay, and get him, sure ask me. And um, what can we do in our gardens to help the bees? How can I bring bees? To my, is it just have a diversity of flowers, or what else can I, I do? I would say if you did a diversity of flowers, <laughs> so if you could cut back on spring and some chemicals. Um, some of these things that, you know, well, I, I really don't want, you know, um, any type of insect around and, and I spray my yard and, and I kill everything, well, that, that'll kill these too. You, you want to keep that in mind. Um, even if you, in, maybe even time of day, um, you know, if you were to spray, and if you spray at night, then people will think there might be something wrong with you and maybe you get different neighbors or something. But, but um, if you, like, you know, a lot of, a lot of places that are conscientious will try to spray some of their things at night when the, when the bees are, inside and so that that's something to think about too because then you won't get the uh, chemical directly onto the bee just right. worry about the residuals yes. yeah just the residuals not right on the bee correct so uh why do beekeepers put their hives so close to roadways they're heavy i don't know you, you can't really the, the, if you're like me I, I i'm out of shape i you know, they, you know, maybe a hundred pounds a box when they're full. So you see, see me carrying three or four, no, maybe half one. And uh, they're heavy, and um, and also, so they drive them out there. And, and if they're closer to the road, then it's it's a lot easier. That's why. That's why I would do it. You know, it'd be nice to have them way in the back. You have to drive through holes and things to you know. That's there. right. It's a compromise. Um, how about do butterflies serve as pollinators of tree fruits or vegetables? Uh, butterflies serve as pollinators also. Um, for example, the sphinx moth on there, um, you, you run about fruits, that, that they, they're, you find them everywhere on grapevines and other vines. Also, you'll find those in um, different types of flowers. They don't necessarily just pollinate one type. Um, I know certain species do, but as far as exactly um, which one only pollinates, for example, apples, I, I don't know. How about, uh, do you know if cities or communities in our state have laws or regulations about having a beehive in town? Um, I, even if you are allowed to have a beehive in town, I would, I would suggest not to. Um, people have been sued for that. And even, if, even you know, it, and many times it wasn't even their bees or even a bee that, and, they, and they, they've lost. And so I would, not, I would not recommend it, even if your town said, yeah, we, we're going to give you free bees and put them out there. I would I would try to make a friend out in the country somewhere and do that versus having them in town. Yeah, unless unless you like a lot of headache, then have them in town, yeah. I would say don't do it. Well but now what if a colony of bees moves into the ground by my home? Is there a way to uh encourage them to move on? Colony of bees, yeah. Um you know, to have them move on versus to just kill them all. Killing them is it's pretty easy to kill them, but um as far as having them move on you can make it a little miserable, maybe turn the water hose on a little more, make it nice and muddy. Um, just make their environment somewhat miserable. I don't know. I don't really know how to do that. You know, maybe walk through there and see what happens to you. Um, no, I don't know. Um, Let's talk about, you know, we get a lot of these questions in the fall and the confusion about bees versus wasps. And, you know, people think there are bees that are attacking them or bees are nesting in the ground when it's actually German yellow jackets, for example. Can you talk right. about that? Yeah, yeah it, a lot of the, a lot of times people will think it's a bee, and it really is a you know wasp or something else. Um, the bees are somewhat docile. Um, I, I've had bees before, well, obviously, and and then um, 
sometimes if it's a gentle hive, not worn gloves, put your hand on there, they'll crawl on you. And then other times they'll sting you, you know. But they're not like um, a wasp where you just walk by and they see it, they come out of nowhere, and they'll sting you multiple times. A honeybee, for example, can sting you once and, and then they, they die. Or a wasp, um, you know, they, they're not going to just go away. They, they'll just keep coming. And so wasps, you can, you know, wasps, also, their populations are more intense in the in the fall, and then that's when we get these bees, so-called bee questions. You get all these uh, all these bee-like pests coming after us in fall, looking for food, and these are actually wasps that are causing aggression. And there are, you know, there are ways to control wasps in the ground. You know, they're like just use the insecticide that we don't we don't want to use for to protect the bees we just use them because that's their the, the wasp uh weakness like carbill or seven just sprinkle some of that dust in a wasp nest at night and that's a that's a good way to control wasp i have somebody else sprinkle never. it I, I wouldn't do it myself i have somebody else do it they're tough yeah, and then there's there's traps for them too, but trapping them is kind of that's just kind of fun because um, there'll be thousands and you won't even make a dent. Um, pray for frost and that, that then it'll all stop and start up again. It's important that people recognize that bees are a positive. Bees are docile. Bees um, we need bees and and, and we should not uh, confuse them with those fall wasp problems. It's true. How about and bumblebees too? You know, they you can get right up to a bumblebee, and as long as you don't, oh, that's really nice. Um, they they'll leave you alone. They 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 don't care. They they just don't care about you. But if you accidentally touch them, they care a little bit. Yeah. How about like city mosquito spraying? Does that harm bees? Um, it was depending on what they're using. Um, the the mosquito spraying though, I, I I'm actually kind of for that. I'm not a big fan of West Nile virus. So and and, and many times, in, in fact, um, when they spray. In almost all cases, I've ever seen it that night. Um, there's also other things you can do too, like mosquito dunks, uh, the Bacillus thuringiensis to kill the mosquitoes. You throw a little chunk in the pond, and it just takes care of it. Everything I've read is supposed to be safe for everything you drink, except for the except for the little larvae, um, or you know, mosquitoes. BT. So I, 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 I like BT a lot better than than a lot of the things. But um, if I had a choice, I, I would say uh, I, I'd rather have no mosquitoes and, and a few dead bees than um, both. The BT applications that they use to kill the larva of mosquitoes, right. that, that's a bee-friendly product. Bacillus thuringiensis is a bee-friendly yeah. product. A lot of your nurses will carry that. They'll say capital B and small t. And like, well, you know, just follow the directions. That's a whole other topic we could have as far as uh, citywide mosquito spraying and what is the true effic efficacy of that, which is very, actually very, very limited. Um, it says here, what do you think about imidacloprid? Have you heard about that controversy? Imidacloprid is a common soil drench that, that we're using more and more in our home landscapes and some of the risk that's, that's affecting our honeybees. Have you heard about that at all? Yeah, I've heard about it. No. <laughs> imidacloprid, I'll talk about it for, 30, for just a few seconds here just because there's a question on it. Imidacloprid is a very common soil drench now that we use to get a systemic action to kill pests, the bores inside of trees, for example. And imidacloprid is, is very powerful against many types of insect pests um, on, on, on several different types of crops. But, but uh, there is data now that suggests we're concerned about imidacloprid and these other uh, neonicotinoids. Um, which are like new nicotine products that are affecting our bee populations. Bees get exposed to these sy systemic chemicals when they work the flowers and the bees, uh, it reduces their foraging activity. It, there's also evidence that they may confuse the bees that can't find their way back home. So is it, you know, as a general rule, Todd, would you say that you should only use insecticides when absolutely necessary from a bee-friendly perspective, and try to and talk. I think, that, I think you can easily overdo it. Um, so, you know, for example, um, you see one insect out there, and it's on your garage, and you quick spray everything, and and it's dead. 
when you could just took enough lice water and squashed it and been done. Um, I, I think there's a lot of overkill with the pesticides, sure. I mean, there, there's time and place for them, and um, yeah, I, I, they're important in some cases, but if you don't have the problem, why treat for it? Um, if there's nobody around that even has this type of whatever insect it would be or whatever concern it is, why treat for it? It, it doesn't make sense. Um, if you have the problem and you follow the directions and take care of it, fine, but you don't need to do, maybe it's just like, you know, you got 30 little whatever right here, you spray right there and you're done. You don't have to do the rest of the yard, you know. I just have a couple of questions. Do you know about what the life expectancy of a bee is? It depends on um, who you talk to and also um, the the queen, for like a honeybee, um, I know more about those, I, I think, anyways, than the native bees, the, the, you know, the, the queen bee. I've heard up to five years, but realistically, maybe a little bit less. Worker bees, um, a lot less. Um, drones only over the summer, which are the male bees. Um, it, 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 that's pretty much in a nutshell. It's not exact. It's not. Um, as far as like your wasp and such, um, my understanding is that in, there's, you know what, 80,000 whatever flying around. You get a good hard frost. The queen is the really intelligent one. She burrows it and hides until spring. Everything else dies and she starts over. One produces thousands. Um, as far as the lifespan, theirs is one season except for the queen can survive longer. As far as how long, I, I don't know. You know what that uh, wooden bee nest that you showed? Um, yeah. Are those leaf cutter bees? They were leaf cutter bees, correct. Yep, very good eye. Um, yep, very good. They're alfalfa leaf cutter bees. Okay, and, and they're, they're a fun little creature too. Um, sometimes you'll get different types of leaf cutter bees on your roses. They'll make a little C shape on there or a half moon, and you quick want to spray for it. Um, usually, the the what they've taken off is so small that. It really is insignificant. It doesn't really even harm the rose, but um, a lot of times people will spray for that. They'll kill them all, and and now you have less. And it was unnecessary. So a queen in that box that you had a you had a that, I don't know. I don't know. But that wasn't mine. That was Russ's box. So you just put up the box and the bees find it, or do you have to? They do. They yeah, if they leave it, we talked to them about it. He said to take and. Um, it's brand new wood. Take a propane torch and, and scorch the outside of it just a little bit, and kind of they, they like that. If you burn it a little bit, and they're they're more attracted to it than not. So something to think about. Yeah, it's fun to burn stuff. You know, if you're allergic to a honeybee, are you allergic to all bees? Would you? Know? If you're allergic to a honeybee, you're allergic to all bees. I, I'd probably say not. Um, the venom is, in my understanding, different with the different bees. That there, when you get stung by a honeybee. It's like almost like a heart-like muscle that pumps the poison into your into your system, and if you don't get that stinger and and um, poison sac out, it'll pump that right into you. And um, sometimes people say, "Oh, I'll just get it," and they grab it and they squish it, and they basically pump it in faster. They they squish the sac and pull it out. You use like a credit card or a spoon or a dull knife, or have somebody help you and just scrape it and flick it out, versus grabbing it and squishing it in. Um, not as good. So as far as if the vans are all the same. Um, my understanding is that they, they're not all the same from, you have 128 different species. I, I, if they're all the same, that'd be unbelievable. I, I, I imagine they're probably all somewhat different as far as chemical, I don't know what. Don't take, don't take any chances. Um, how about, uh, I think those, uh, do wasp and uh, hornets, are they pollinators? No. Yeah, I, I've heard that they can, yeah, do some pollinating. They're they're mainly a predator, though. They're um, they like to, well, for example, um, one life cycle that you might find with them is they'll find a spider, um, inject it, with, knock them out basically, and they'll lay eggs inside of it. The eggs will hatch out inside of it. The, the spider will wake up, start walking around, and they'll eat and eat and eat until finally there's you know the spider can't take it and they burst out and they're ready to start over. Another one is they'll, you know, once in a while if you watch, if you just sit and watch and don't move, you'll see a little tiny wasp dragging a huge spider back into its little hole and they'll drag it back in there and they'll, um, you know, basically put it in a coma, lay eggs around it and their larvae hatch out and they eat the um, spider alive and then they start up again. So they're, they're a very interesting thing. They, they don't like, oh, let's have some honey from these guys. No, it's, um, you don't get honey from them. They're, they're more of a predator type of a creature. A hamburger in the in the fall and a bunch fly on your hand. 
um, I, I almost guarantee there there's no bees there. So bees don't like hamburgers. I don't know, I don't know if they do, but I think they'd rather have some more nutrition. Okay, uh, that's it for our questions on bees. And uh, before we call it quits for tonight, uh, we can just open it up for a couple, couple minutes here. Does anybody have any questions that weren't addressed? Um, in uh, any of our sessions, we can, Todd's uh, jack of all trades. He can, he can help us ask, answer any questions. If anybody has a last question that they want to ask. Yeah, general acreage. Uh, I, for some reason, 80 acres comes to mind, but I, I really don't know. I, I don't know. 60 acres. Is it 60? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the question was the size of Absaraca, it's over 60 acres. Any other questions out there? Todd, did you have a well, one thing about going out to Absarac, um I've gone out there and, and you just can't see it all. You have to, it's almost like you have to go more than once. And, and what I do is I kind of focus on maybe um, evergreens or I'll focus on birch or, or whatever. And, um, and, and that's, that, that I find that enjoyable. You can try to go through it all, but it's almost like running. Um, there, there's just so much out there. And so I, I would say that um, definitely worth a person's time more than once to go out there. And about the honeybees, are they... Um, are the introduced species out competing our native ones? Uh, introduced species, uh, you mean the honeybees? They've been around for a long time, over a hundred years. I really don't know how long they've actually been here. Um, I, I wouldn't say that they're out competing. No, I, I wouldn't think so at all. Like native bees. In a nutshell, what, what would you recommend? I want to have some more native bees in my landscape, Todd. What should I do? Well, more flowers. Um, and if you if you only could plant one kind of flower, sunflowers seem to attract tons of bees. Um, in if you don't, well, diversity, right? But if you could only do one, just do a sunflower. <laughs> but no, do a diversity. But if, if you have a chance and you want to get some really big pictures, um, a sunflower, nice big yellow head, walk up to it and look, you'll probably find ten or more different species of bees on there, and they're all getting along. Sometimes they'll push against each other to get the best whatever, but um, yeah, and everyone will have different, well, they won't all have different, but there'll be, uh, there'll be so many in a sunflower field, you'll, you'll just be amazed. So if you have a good camera, that'd be good, but otherwise, um, all your native flowers, you know, wander out there and look, or just sit and wait, and, and they'll come in. The honeybees are kind of lazy compared to, the, like, the bumblebees. They start later in the day. They don't like it when it's raining. They stay inside, so they just, they just there's a lot of jokes I could say, but we're being taped, so they're not. Because um, I usually put myself in trouble as far as what kind of worker I am. So uh, milk leads a good one, especially for the monarchs, um, and, and that's that's another fascinating topic altogether. Um, just just life cycle of a monarch. Wow. And it's like, well, it's a weed. What should I don't really want to do it. You can clip off the pods. I mean, you know, you don't. If you really only want, uh, you know, it's perennial. I'm going to plant a lot of different flowers because they all have different bloom times. I always have a, want a source of pollen for my bees. I want Clean to water. minimize the use of uh, insecticides because insecticides are bee killers, right, in general. And especially stay away from any persistent insecticides. Uh, maybe you put up a bee nest box, wouldn't hurt. So those are all, you do that and you're on your way to having a healthier garden. Okay, last yeah. chance for any question before we shut it down for tonight? Somebody wants, somebody wants Tom's home phone number? I have that. No, no, no you don't want that. Um,